of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Direct, O Lord, all our actions by thy holy inspirations and carry them on by thy gracious assistance. So to prepare and work of ours, we begin from thee and by thee, be happily in through Christ our Lord. Amen. Mary, seed of wisdom. Amen. In the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen. Okay, so in the second conference, we want to talk about uh, how brainwashing functions from a Thomistic point of view or from a psychological point of view, the structure that it has. Um, obviously, there's multiple aspects to the individual parts, which I'm going to go into, so we're not going to go into every single facet of it, but we just want to get a general outline so that you can get a, general, a sense of what's going on in our own culture and see, you can see the structure of how it's actually uh, occurring. But before we do that, the first thing we want to do is, in order to talk about brainwashing, you have to talk about how someone is intellectually formed growing up or uh, even after they've grown up, how they can continue to be intellectually formed or even modify their way of thinking, etc. So we have to talk about that structure first, and then we can talk about what they, the mechanism that they use to deform that, to change the form, because uh, brainwashing is essentially that, that is stripping the intellect, intellect and the cognitive faculties of their, um, their uh, patterns of thinking, essentially is what it does. Okay. So, in the Thomistic understanding, we have the five senses. This, this puts us in contact with reality through the senses. The, the five senses unify the, the, the sense data. By, that's, uh, these five senses are unified by the common sense power. That's the CSP there, the common sense power. So, it, it unifies them, uh, brings them together. It does a few other functions, but it, that's the primary thing it does. It unifies the sense data and expresses that sense data as a unified image, or St. Thomas calls a phantasm, into the imagination. So I have this experience uh, sensorily, it gets unified, and then it's moved, in, and then it's put in my imagination in the form of an image. Um, we know that it does, that there is this, they actually know which part of the brain it is. They also know that this, how this thing functions, because part of it is time sequencing, so, for example, some people, we know that they're, that particular part of their brain breaks down because they hear things at a different time that they see it. So they'll see somebody talking, and then, like, 13 seconds later, they'll hear that in their imagination. Okay. So this is, it gets pressed into the image, uh, into the imagination in the form of an image. Concomitantly, at the same time, it's pressed, that sense information is pressed into memory. How do we know, even though I may be focusing my attention with my will maybe to focus on a particular image and I'm experiencing these things, the way we know that these things are still getting into the memory is from our own common experience. So the way that we actually know, the way we actually know that this, uh, that this common sense power uh, expresses it into memory is because of our own common experience. So we can be talking about something, um, say suppose we're over in the kitchen and we're talking and then um, somebody's baking an apple pie we, we're smelling the apple pie, uh, we might even be hearing the activity going on out there, but our focus is on, say, a discussion about something in politics, right? So then after, afterwards, we think, hey, did you smell the pie? Did you, did you hear that? And you're like, yeah, there was all sorts of racket going on, even though that wasn't what was in the imagination at the time, okay? So then what happens is, is the, the, once the image comes in, the cogitative power, its function is to go look at the image in the imagination, go back into memory, and make an association of what this image is uh, in relationship to those things that are in memory, that it has in memory. Then it takes that information from memory and merges it with the image in the imagination. So, for example, uh, a woman walks into the room, I first see her, and then my cogitative, I, that image gets put into my imagination. Cogitative power goes back in, gets the information, brings about, merges it with the image in the imagination. Then I immediately recognize this is my mother, right? And we know this is all done because this, the, these functions that we've been talking about are all done at a material level. And the way we know this is because of Alzheimer's. In Alzheimer's, people can't, the cogitative power is blocked from accessing the memory to get the information to merge it with the image. So they, they see that image comes into their imagination. They see the same thing that they've always seen, but their uh, cogitative power can't get the information from the memory to merge it with the image and the imagination. So they can't make that association of who this person is. That's why they can't remember 
You know, they'll, even though they might have been married to somebody all their life, they don't really know who they are. Okay. So the cogitative power then does three things. The first is that it just makes an association and it also disassociates. So as I've mentioned, um, the association would be I'm associating this image with my mother. The disassociation when someone says, hey, your mom's coming into the room right now and someone walks in and it's not my mother, the cogitative power goes back and, and looks at the image of the mother and compares it and then puts in the image, no, that's not your mother, All right? So then I know, okay, that's not my mother. All right, so, but the disassociation can also be someone comes up and says, hey, this is the best chocolate you will ever eat in your entire life. So you're like, no, yeah, no, let's try it out. So you try it out, and then once you taste it, it gets into the image of the imagination, because your power goes back into memory. It remembers that particular chocolate you had at the factory in Belgium or in Switzerland, comes back, merges with the image of the imagination, and you're like, yeah, no, this is not the best chocolate I've ever had. Hershey's chocolate is not the best chocolate I've ever had. Okay, so it can disassociate those things on that level. The next is it makes uh, an assessment of whether the thing is good or bad, not morally speaking, but purely on a material level. And this occurs by it um, assessing, um, you know, based on, uh, at least the way Aristotle talks, um, it's based upon uh, pleasure and pain. Does this thing cause pleasure? Then it's actually probably good. Does it cause emotional delight? Then it's probably good. If it doesn't, then it's bad. It's a very crude um, a kind of an assessment, and we can actually, we'll see this a little bit later, we can actually form that, that process of making that assessment. This is, this assessment that it's good or bad is a perspective that we have, and that perspective is actually put on the image in the imagination. So let me give an example to this. So a guy, he's first married, he just gets married, and his wife comes into the room, and so he, the wife is in his image, in his, in his eyes, right? That gets in, that gets unified by the common sense power, his seeing her and hearing her, etc. The image gets put in, the cogitative power goes back, because they had a wonderful dating process or courtship. He's like, isn't she so wonderful? So the cogitative power makes this assessment of, hey, she's great, I love this woman. And then it puts it in the, uh, in the image and the imagination, and then, he's sitting and his attitude is, she's great. Okay. Then after 10 years of a lot of memories, what happens is the uh, image, because there's more memories in relationship to that, the cogitative power looks at the image. It's the same wife, right? So it's the same image when it first comes in, the cogitative power goes back, it remembers all the fighting that they did, all the difficulties that they had, or uh, the ill treatment he received from her, and then it gets merged with the image and the imagination, and she walks in, and he's like, oh, the old battle axe, right? The image is the same initially, but it gets modified. The perspective changes, okay? We can actually change our perspective on things. Uh, here we're talking about our perspective, not intellectual perspective, but our imaginative perspective. We can, but this assessment is a perspective. Is this thing good or bad? Okay, when the assessment is made that this thing is good or bad, then based upon that good or bad um, perspective, once that image, the perspective on the image is changed, then the appetites move to the image based upon the perspective that's put on it. So, for example, the, uh, so when the wife first walks in, there's a good association, so the, the appetite or the emotion the appetite is moved, the concupiscible of appetite is moved, and he experiences the motion of delight, right? If they just had a knockdown drag out that morning and she said a lot of hurtful things, then the assessment is, you know, it looks at all those hurts that it's occurred in the past because even our emotional experiences are also stored in memory. That's putting bring back in the image. And so then he, what arises initially is anger, okay? So the emotions move in that respect. The last thing that it, uh, the cogitative power does is it prepares the image for abstraction. This is uh, the process which gets all this information necessary to get to the image so that when I abstract from it and I conceptually understand something, I'm actually understanding the thing or have a sufficient knowledge of the thing. And when I make a judgment, there's sufficient information in it to make a proper judgment. This 
pro the, the process of learning a science, say like a, a, bio, a biology or chemistry, in addition to it being an intellectual um, habit, which we'll see in a bit, it's also a series of associations that are made in relationship to the cogitative, that the cogitative power makes. And so that over the course of time, if something comes into the image and the imagination, then it can go back and it will bring more information back to that by based on its association. So it's preparing this thing for abstraction so that when I make a judgment about it, I have a better image in relationship to it than if I've never studied the science. Okay. Then once the image, by the way, this is all shorthand. You can read my long book if you want to get this in longhand. The, uh, uh, age and intellect, we're not going to talk too much about that. That's the AI part here. It's watching as this image gets formed. Once it reaches a sufficient level of preparation by the cogitative power, then it automatically abstracts the concept that is latent in the image. Um, there's a whole process by how that actually happens, why it happens, how it happens in my book. But it, it, it abstracts from this image the actual concept which is the essence of the thing and presses it into the possible intellect. And as soon as that happens, then I actually understand dogness, for example. So if I see a dog running around, right, then um, once it's prepared for abstraction, once, it, once the abstraction occurs and the essence is in the possible intellect, then I understand dogness. This is what a dog is, okay. Then the possible intellect makes an active judgment by converting back to the image. So it looks first at the essence in the, in, within itself, and then it looks back at the image, compares the two, or uh, um, uh, uh, either unites that um, two parts to the judgment, the proposition and the, and the um, cause it's always a proposition, that is the subject and the predicate actually go together or they don't. So for example, it will actually look at dogness, then it'll go back into the image, it sees, you know, Fido and Scruffy and all the other dogs, and it notices that they're all four-footed. Okay. So then it makes a judgment that dogs, that's the essence of the thing, are four-footed. Okay. Those are the accidental qualities or part of the qualities of it. So it makes a judgment about that. In the case of conscience, when I judge something is morally good, it's presented to the will, or something is presented to the will for consideration. The will can either move the possible intellect to make a different kind of a judgment or look at it from a different point of view, or it can move the lower faculties, including the imagination, cognitive power, memory. It can't move the emotions directly. It can only change the perspective on the image and the imagination in order to affect the emotions. Okay, so that's how this thing works. Pretty quick but it gives you an idea. We now wanna talk about how intellectual formation occurs as a person's growing up and even after they've become an adult, okay? So the first thing that has to occur, that occurs in relationship to um, intellectual formation is the making or uh, creating the proper things in external reality that will create the proper image so that when the cogitative power looks at that image, it knows that two things are actually associated or not associated. So the first thing you do is you have to start building in the cogitative power the it's natural, because it, it's by nature, it's just designed to make these associations. You have to start training it to make these particular associations and disassociations. So for example, this is how children learn language. When they hear, when, when we hold up the cookie, you say, you know, do you want the cookie? You want the cookie? And he's like, eventually he hears the word cookie that gets associated with this little biscuit thing. And then he's able to make those associations. So that's how we start building it. And that's how we build it with children, right? We also know that that's um, in relationship to the assessment because children act primarily on pleasure and pain. Then what you have to do is you have to start building in the uh, cognitive power a series of associations in which what is good behavior and bad behavior, with good behavior, you reward the child so there's a pleasure that's associated with it, which then means later down the road when, the, when this thing comes into the imagination, 
the cogitative power will associate pleasure with this particular form of behavior and the kid will act that way. Not always, of course, it's not absolute. And then with the disassociation, so you also have to disassociate it, but you also have to associate pain with bad behavior. It has to be moderated, of course. And then that's how you, that's the initial process of forming the child. So this has to do with the process of forming or building the, associate, the, the, the associations of the, of the cogitative power in relationship to certain things. That, pro, that foundation actually becomes the foundation for the moral code later, what people actually think is morally right and wrong. And so how you form the kids' associations and disassociations before they reach the age of reason is going to determine, in large part, their patterns of thinking later because these associations are built up in the cogitative power. Okay, this is before the use of reason. Once they get the use of reason, so this is in the cogitative power, the second thing is, is St. Thomas says that all habits are voluntary. And what he means by that is this. When you, uh, for us to actually develop a habit, and what's a habit? A habit is not just this association or uh, just a physical inclination. Habits are actually qualities in our various faculties of our soul that incline us to perform a specific kind of action or activity. Okay. So these have, and the way we get a habit is by performing that action over and over again. And so what happens is, is over the course of time, there's a quality that's built up in the faculty, which includes, so when that object comes into, uh, into our uh, experience again, then we have a specific kind of an inclination towards it, uh, at least initially that, that habit does. Okay. And this is why St. Thomas says that ultimately habits determine, so there's good habits and bad habits, good habits are virtues, bad habits are vices. The habits determine how the faculty actually relates to that object. So for example, someone who's an alcoholic, when they um, get around alcohol, their concupiscible appetite has been unregulated, and so it wants more than is properly, uh, because, it's, uh, because of the habit of just giving it what it wants, it now has become intemperate and now it wants this thing without uh, restraint, okay. So this is, that, that's by way of example, but the also the opposite is true is that you can start developing good habits by what you choose, right? Because by, by voluntary it means the will will move the various faculties in order to uh, perform the actions or perform or to think of the thing in a specific way and then that starts to build the habits in the, uh, in the various faculties. This is one, and why do we know that habits are voluntary? You see it all the time in children. The kid who does the external compliance thing, where he just externally complies because he has to externally comply because the parents are forcing him to do this, does not develop the virtue in relationship to the action that he's performing. How do you know that? He leaves and he doesn't do it. Whereas if, he's, whereas if he enters into it volitionally, says, okay, I'll do it so I can develop this virtue. When he leaves, then he has the virtue and those particular actions become easier. Okay. So back to the cogitative power. In relationship to the cogitative power, once the person reaches the age of reason, the continued associations and disassociations that are presented to him, and when he chooses to accept the truth of those or look at those in a certain way, etc., when the will starts moving these lower faculties because it becomes operative later, then in the cogitative power, there are certain habits that start to form in the cogitative power about how you look at something. That is the perspective that you have on it, whether you consider this to be associated with that or not, etc. <clears throat> And so that, that cogitative power becomes habituatable. It's one of the most habituatable faculties they are. How do we know? Because once you realize your thinking is wrong, your images, you're, you're fighting how you're thinking about this thing for long periods of time until you get it under control, until the cogitative power finally makes the right associations because it has to, that habituation has to be done in a different fashion. Okay, so in relationship to these two, the question becomes, how do you change the cogitative powers association? So, for example, um, if, and you actually see this uh, occurring uh, to some degree in, uh, in the news media, 
where they'll present something. Uh, let's just use the example, orange man bad, orange man bad, orange man bad. So what they're doing is they're trying to associate with the orange man uh, and a bad association so that they can elicit a specific emotional response, right? And they just keep doing this, right? Even, and so what happens is, is that the association's made, if the person gives volitional consent, or, yeah, he is bad, then what happens is, is that the confirmation, the cogitative power, when it makes that association, is then confirmed by the will, because the will says yes to the image, and that means that the will, then the will confirms the cogitative power in that habituation or that association, and it starts to develop a habit of thinking, okay? So, um, but as parents, we have to do this, and the, the parents have to do this in the sense of make, you're making sure, no, you don't want to do this, this is what you want to do, and they present it. Once a ch child reaches the age of reason, the more a rational argument can be presented, the more the will will give consent to that association, and the more likely the child will see that it's true, okay? And so you can build, that's how you build these associations. The way you change it is by presenting the opposite. So let me give you a classic example that you see among men today. Because of the problem with pornography out there, a lot of men, as soon as they see women, the first thing that comes into their mind by the association, because what's happened? They've been looking at pornography, so the association of, of women with uh, a specific kind of pleasure is made. It's just, and what happens is, is that if they experience it, that even confirms that it becomes much stronger. And so, the stronger our experiences of a thing, the more the cogitative power is likely to make that association. And if the will has given into it, then their habits of thinking and the cogitative power are always looking at women from that point of view. So then, what happens is you see this all the time with uh, with uh, Catholic males. Then they get to the point where they realize, I got to get my act together. So then what they do is they say, I, I've got to, you know, stop uh, looking at pornography. I've got to stop doing all these other things. I've got to stop thinking about women that way. And then it's frustrating to them because every time a woman walks in, that's the first thought that comes into their mind. Of course it is, because that's what you've habituated the cogitative power. And what, what does it mean? It means, so then they're like, well, I've been working at it for a couple of months. Sorry. You've been doing this for years, years. You've been uh, uh, confirming the cogitative power in that association for years. That's why when you go to change your mind about it or change the image, the cogitative power is not going to want to look at it that way because you've been training it to do something different. It's like a dog. You know, you can't expect to train a dog for years in something and then do it once and then expect him to be different. That's not how it works. So it's the same thing here, but you can, so how do we change the cogitative powers um, uh, associations? There's two steps. The first is you have to say no. So when the cogitative power makes the association, let's take the guys in, in relationship to women, the first thing you have to do when it comes into the mind, in the very beginning, the cogitative power has to say no. No to that association. Has to, and it has to move the imagination to look at it, uh, to, to remove the image from the imagination. No, you're not thinking about that. No, you're not thinking about that. Over the course of time, the cogitative power lines, oh, okay, when this thing comes in, I, I don't think about it. But that takes time, right? So, Because you're, you're the habit has been built up, and in order to corrupt the habit, you have to work at it for a while to go, come against it, right? In order, and then at a certain point, the virtue is going to start to be built, and then you'll get to the point where the cogitative power is going to make the proper association. So the first thing is you have to say no. The second time, then the second part is you have to reformulate the image. So over the course of time, once it gets proficient in saying no, I'm not going to look at it this way. No, that's not how it's okay. Then what happens is at a certain point, once once it comes into the what comes into the imagination, and he notices that it's not there's that initial assessment is not made immediately, or that he finds it very easy to change his image and his imagination, then he can start reformulating the image. So when the image of a woman comes into his mind, he can start reformulating it. Say from the if we take a different perspective on it, like this is a child of God who's destined for beatific vision. Or this is a person who is, has a certain dignity and should be treated as such, right? Or from points of view of justice. So he can start changing how he ends up looking at the individual. Over the course of time, as he keeps willing that, and it takes a lot of work, as he keeps willing that, the habits 
in the cogitative power, so the associations will be broke, the habits in the cogitative power will slowly begin to change, and then eventually he starts looking at women in a properly or rightly ordered fashion. Okay, so that's, that's that process. So that's just the first stage of intellectual formation. The second level of, so that's on the cogitative power. The second one is the memories have to change. There has to be a change in memory. So I'll put it in the forms of trauma because that's one of the easiest way I work with people who are traumatized and it's, uh, it's very common. When people have a, tra a very, very traumatic event, there's a whole set of associations and disassociations because it's come into the senses and it's really strong, then the cogitative power makes the association to the degree of the strength of that thing. And so it gets put in the memory and then when a person gets around people are, that are like it, so for example, suppose their father beat them mercilessly all their life, right? And so whenever they get around any man that has any, that's a father figure, what happens is the cogitative power immediately makes that uh, association the, of the trauma and merges it with the image. And so the person gets around them and they're just like all tore up, even though it's not their father, it's made that association. Well, this is like the father. And so they get uh, tore up about it, okay? What has to happen is, is that they have to go back in the memory and start changing the memories. Now, we don't falsify the memories because you can't say, well, you have to go back and look at it as if your father never beat you. Well, that's not helpful, right? Because that's just contrary to the truth. What you have to do is you have to go back and look at it and realize, okay, God was there. He allowed this to happen to me. And the reason he wanted this to happen to me because there was a good he wanted me to achieve in my later life that I didn't get when I was younger, right? And if I hadn't gone through this trauma, I never would have realized how merciful he is, how good he is, etc. So the memories, so what happens is the memories begin to change. And then that begins also to start changing the cogitative powers associations. So how you imagine the thing, the association, dissociation, or what you associate with those images gets stored back in memory. So whenever, whenever you imagine, it gets put in memory, and then that, can, that will affect the cogitative power at a later date. So the memories have to change. One of the key things I tell this in relationship to guys who have struggled with chastity, I tell them, the way you're gonna get that memory thing out under control is first follow this mechanism where I told you do the no and then you reformulate it. You gotta go through that process. And that'll also start to change the memory, but you also have to ask for the grace of forgetfulness which is basically, it's not that you can't remember it, it's just that you're not in the habit of recalling it. Because the memory, St. Thomas and the whole moral tradition also considers habituatable by what you remember. So you have to, you basically have to change the habits in the memory of what, what you remember, okay? So the memories has to change and then also what you remember has to change. Okay, this is all gonna become really important when we start talking about how brainwashing works. The next is the emotions, when the, when, when the assessment is made by the cogitative power, there's a specific emotional response to that image. Okay, now in the modern music industry, or the modern uh, media industry, they're very good at taking certain forms of music, certain lighting and stuff, and putting it around the image that you have. And in that, by that very process, the cogitative power makes certain kinds of association in relationship to what you're looking at. So for example, if you want to portray a particular individual as evil, when he walks into the room, the lighting is a light slightly more shaded on him than it is everybody else. And they hear this, as he walks in, this low-toned music in relationship to him. And then, then you immediately, the cogitative power associates, this guy's bad, right? Okay. So that's that you can prepackage that association to elicit a specific emotional response. So in this particular case, it's fear, because we know this guy's going to go around murdering people, right? Okay. So you can prepackage the emotional response by what's the associations or the assessment that is integrated into the image that's fed to the individual. This is what this is what Hollywood does. This is what the TV does. This is what the news media does. This is what they all do. They prepackage the assessment, and therefore they're trying to elicit a specific emotional response. Take for example, what do they do? They tell you that people are dying in droves from COVID. They're just dying right and left. And there's, 
you know, they're just stacking bodies everywhere, right? And then they'll show some place in, you know, in, in Africa where they've left and there's you know they're just stacking bodies everywhere right and then they'll show some place in you know in, in Africa where they've got a mass grave well that's because there's a completely different situation on there or they'll say the, the hospitals are just completely jam-packed and then what do they do they show you they, and they'll telling us that in the United States the hospitals are packed they're packed they're packed and then what do they do they show you imagery from the hospitals that are full in Italy right so the point being is, is that they prepackage all that because they're trying to elicit fear, for example. Okay, just by way of example. But parents do the same thing to their ch with their children all the time, right? So, and, in a good sense. So, for example, you know, um, they'll say, you know, they'll say, well, we're going to go to church. Dude, don't you want to go to church? This is wonderful. We're going to church. You know, Jesus is there. You know, so you build it up. And so the child gets kind of emotionally excited to go see Jesus, right? Okay, so this is... So, and there, that the emotions, when the emotions move, that experience of the emotion gets merged with the image, which gets stored in memory, which then also strengthens the, the association of the cogitative power relationship. Because if I have no emotional response to something, the cogitative power is like, eh, it's not that important. Whereas if I have a really strong emotional uh, response to it, the cogitative power is like, okay, this is serious, right? I got to really watch this situation or this search because I, because I, you know, because the fear that was really strong in there, I could easily get hurt. Okay. So it makes those associations. Okay. So the memory has to change. So, and then the emotional response, our emotional responses are also habituatable. I tell people, if you have any emotional response to anything that is completely un, that is regulated in any way, Aside from what reason thinks it should or should not be, that's called antecedent appetite, and it's disordered, and it's a vice. It tells you that the emotions have been habituated to respond in this particular way in relationship to this. You see this a lot of times with people who have been married for years. Their initial, the cogitative power makes the association, and their initial emotional response is anger. When they're around the person, they have a hard time fighting the anger. It's contrary to the will. It occurs before they even have a chance to think about it, etc. Okay. But this emotional response, um, the appetites are habituatable. That's called virtue. So, for example, temperance is in the concupiscible appetite in relationship with the emotions of delight and love and things of that sort. And then there's also the, um, the uh, virtues in the irascible appetite, and that's the appetite that deals with things like fear. So I, the, when the fear is regulated, that's part of the virtue of fortitude, etc. And so the more virtuous I become, what happens is it goes back to... As I, if I'm really virtuous, when that thing comes into the imagination, the cogitative power has already been trained. No, you, you only respond this much in relationship to this thing. So there's actually, if you've reached a, a perfection in virtue in an area, there's no initial emotional response whatsoever. There's only the, the subsequent emotional response that follows from reason when the intellect judges, okay, this is really bad, and we need to take a look at this. Then the will moves the image to consider the badness of it, then the emotional response, it's called consequent appetite. Then that follows upon it. Okay. This consequent appetite is extraordinarily important for two reasons. One, St. Thomas says is that the reason God gave us emotions is so that we could execute things more easily. And you see this. People who emotionally aren't in the mood to eat don't eat. Well, if you're always that way, you'd starve to death. If you never had any emotions, you'd starve to death. Most people would, right? Okay. The opposite is the case is in the sense too, though, is, is that this emotional response, St. Thomas says, so it helps the people to execute the action easily. Okay, I can eat now because reason says, hey, this is going to be pretty good. Let's eat. Okay. The second component is, is that what the will moves in relation, the perspective it puts on the image, which determines the emotion, the consequent emotional response, that confirms the cogitative powers assessment into what emotion is going to follow. And then it also determines, um, because the, uh, the emotions are moved by what's in the uh, imagination, it starts to train the emotions to move to a certain degree or to not to move, when to move, etc. And that's how you actually start to train the emotional response in relationship to things. And so it actually confirms the antecedent emotions, or it says no to them, or it directs them, or etc. Okay. So the emotions then... They have habits. These are the various virtues and vices. 
um, temperance and fortitude being the carnal ones. The last one is the habits of intellectual judgment. Technically speaking, this is called science or sciency in Latin. But basically what this means is this. When you make an intellectual judgment about the truth of something, because as I mentioned, the cogitative power, the intellect, looks at the essence in, in it, it goes back to the image in the imagination and makes a judgment about it. And that's where truth lies. I know that, that, that you know, that dogs are four-footed. Why? Because I know the essence of a dog. And then in my image is the fact that I've been in contact with reality because the fact that it comes from something that's real or from memory is also part of the image. So if I've had a lot of experiences and I've seen, I'm looking at the dog right now, right, for example, then that gets in. I know from my experience of the thing that it's actually from reality. And as a result of that, I make a judgment that yes, dogs are four-footed. Okay, so that's where I know the truth of the matter. What happens is, is that as you habituate how you judge something, if you keep looking at something and you're judging it from a particular point of view, you start to develop habits in the, in the possible intellect. And this we call science. So for example, um, I'll give you an example. So my cousin who's got his doctorate in pharmaceutical chemistry, he can look at a cell, right? Or he can look at a chemical equation and he can, what he, I, we both have the same image initially. His cogitative power is going to make some associations with that. But when he goes to make a judgment, because over the course of time he has judged it with precision and, and, then, uh, and built that precision, that is the habit of looking at it from a specific point of view and he keeps looking at that, then his judgment becomes much more precise, much more acute, <clears throat> and he's actually to, able to see the truth about something in a different way than I am. So when we look at the same equation, he is going to judge or have <clears throat> this judgment is a form of knowledge. He's going to have a knowledge that I do not have, period. Okay. And so as we grow up, this is what actually ends up happening. So, uh, and this judgment is also volitional. So if you raise people, you know, and you make the association that, you know, um, the United States is a good thing, right? It's a good thing. We have bad politicians. We've had evil things going on, but it's still a good thing. We should try and um, do the best we can for our country, etc. And you start out with the little kids that way, having them wag the flag, etc. And then at a certain, we're making these associations. Then over the course of time, you talk to them about the good things we get from our country. It's history, the, the good things we've done in our country. Not, and it might be good to talk about some of the bad things, but how we can correct that, etc. Then over the course of time, as the child grows up, he starts judging, yeah, the United States is a good thing. So that when it comes time, then, so then uh, by the time all of this formation gets done, he gets to the point where he realizes, no, the United States is a good thing. It's not perfect, but at least it's a good thing. Okay. That's how we intellectually form somebody. Okay. School as Aristotle said, is all about creating the right images so that the right judgments can, and associations can be made about the imagery. So it's all about putting the right images together so that I make the right associations and then I make the right judgments. Okay. The better a teacher is, the more proficient he is at creating the right kinds of images. Okay. How does brainwashing work then? Once a person achieves a certain level of intellectual formation, well, let's just back up. Because of this process, as I've laid it out, this is exactly why the communists want complete control over the intellectual formation of children. Why? <clears throat> because they know that if you send a kid to school and you're giving him one set of associations, and then the parents come and say, that's not true, what happens is the cogitative power learns that, oh yeah, these people say that, but my parents, who I actually trust more, say no, that's not the case. And so that what happens is the cogitative power is not confirmed in the association they want the kid to have. And as a result of that, they realize, okay, then that means that uh, the, the, the kid ends up believing the parents. And so his, his formation, even if he's getting this other stuff there, his formation is going to be along a certain trajectory, normally speaking, normally speaking, okay? And that's why they don't want the parents having any input. They don't want the parents around because they know the minute that happens that the, the associations that they're trying to build up and the intellectual formation that they're trying to build up in the, in the child will get negated at home through this process, right? Okay. 
Because once the kid makes a judgment, well, my, my parents said, well, this is bad because of X, Y, and Z. Well, that makes more sense to me. Once that happens, then the image changes, cognitive change, power is going to change, etc. Even the kid's emotional response to the thing is going to change. So that's why they don't want it to happen. So the, that's why they want the control of the formation in the first at least 12 years of people's lives. This is also why we have millennials and younger who are essentially communists because they were trained in communist think. They, their intellectual formation was communist, right? And so this is, this is actually what you're going to end up with. Okay. When it comes to brainwashing, therefore... Brainwashing essentially consists in stripping the habits of the cogitative power, memory, emotions, and the possible intellect. Your goal is ultimately to get to the possible intellect, which I'll talk about here in a while, to get the person's judgment to change. Okay. And the reason, well, let's just do it now. So the reason for that is if the person's judgment changes, once the person makes a judgment, if that's presented to the will, and then the will gives consent or gives consent to it, and then moves the lower faculties to consider this thing under what it knows to be true, then all this, all the lower faculties begin to change slowly. So if I can get, if I can start affecting people's judgment, then I can start affecting people's ability to uh, um, to the, this lower part of this to actually think, and I can also even determine their emotional response. One thing I didn't talk about is when I have an emotional response, that gets merged with the image. I did mention that. But when it comes time for the possible intellect to make a judgment, when it goes back to the image, if there's an emotional response, then what happens is the judgment of the intellect is drawn to excess or defect. Why? Because the emotion makes the thing seem worse than it is or better than it is. For example, if, you know, if all I hear for a month at a time is that there's all these people dying from this thing, there's all these people dying from this thing, and ooh, whoa, whoa, you know, there's a lot of people that are suffering fear from this thing, and they're making all these associations, and they're getting people worked up emotionally. Once those emotions get in there, people's judgment about what is prudent goes out the window. Right. So, for example, the fact that they spent so much time and energy building up this fear in people's minds, even though that there's a lot of um, medical contraindication for getting this thing, people are not capable of looking at that without this emotional response. And so they look at the contraindications, although that's not that bad, uh, I th or, or that's, that's just not true or whatever. And so they go to excess of like the, the fear drives me to say, I, I got to get the shot. I got to get the shot. Right. So this is what this is part of what they're actually doing. That's how they want to affect people's um, judgment is by eliciting specific emotions. And this is why it just annoys the living daylights out of me. I can't watch virtually any mainstream news media on television because the whole thing is emotion laden. Everything they do is emotion laden because they're trying to get you, you're, they're trying to affect your judgment by that process in a very specific way. And my attitude is, like, get rid of the emotional nonsense. I don't need to see the woman bawling about the fact that her house got mowed down by a tornado. Just show me the damage from the tornado. That's all I got to see to realize, okay, someone suffered a lot in this, right? I don't need to this, all this emotional stuff, okay? So... <clears throat> and so we, they, okay, so the first, the, the goal is to strip the cogitative power, memory, emotions, and the, uh, their possible intellect of their habits. That is, how they're inclined to judge or to associate or to remember, etc. The, the goal is to strip them of, of those patterns, that is, the habits of how they're inclined to do that. Then the second thing is, is to break the associations and the disassociations that you don't want. Okay, this is done in three steps. Well, I should say there's three things that are actually required. The first is if, if, you have a, if you have a habit and you don't want that habit, then you have to shoot for the opposite habit of that. So, for example, if I'm eating too much, which is intemperance, then I have to fast, which is the opposite of eating too much. And so through that process, that eventually my uh, concupiscible appetite will learn to be 
disciplined, okay? So you go from, if you got one habit, the way you corrupt it is by going to uh, the opposite extreme, okay? In this particular case, so the first thing that they do is they present a series of associations and disassociations on their, laden with the emotional side of it in order to do what? That is, that is the opposite of what uh, opposite of the um, of the formation. So, for example, you have people going around tearing statues down of, of, the, of some of these guys that were in the South. Well, these were these despite whatever you might think about the war and uh, the Civil War, these were noble men who fought valiantly, and had courage, etc. There's all sorts of aspects to it. Or you'll see them. Um, uh, you'll actually see them say things like, well, the entire history of the United States is, is an example of white supremacy, right? So that, which is contrary to our thinking, right? So the first thing you do is you set up um, this process in which it's not just once or twice, it has to be constant. So this first step is the constant process of causing or putting this stuff in a person's head so that it corrupts their habits. So let's walk through it. If in my sense is I keep getting told that because you're white, you're racist, because you're white, you're racist, because you're white, you're racist. Well, I know all sorts of people that aren't white that are racist. But if you keep, if they keep saying that, what happens is the cogitative power starts to make that the association. If I don't, in my will, which is we're going to see how you combat this in the next conference. If through my will, I don't negate that most of the time or all of the time, What's going to happen is the cogitative power is going to say, oh, well, the will's not doing anything, and there, or the upper faculties aren't doing anything, so this must be the association. And then over the course of time, the person's association, that habit, of, and even their memories of these things, the memory starts to change. Remember, I said you had to change your memories. The memories start to change. The association of the cogitative power gets corrupted. So the initial uh, formation gets corrupted. And then you start habituating the cognitive power once a person kind of signs off well, then listening to this nonsense, right? Okay. So people, and this is one of the reasons why it's important that, you know, you don't voluntarily put your faculties at these people's disposal, right, by watching certain kinds of mean, mainstream media unless you're doing specific things. Okay. So these habits begin to start to be, um, begin to be stripped on the lower level. Meanwhile, they're putting an emotional response in relationship to this negation that they're trying to perform. So, for example, they'll say, like, you know, if you don't believe that white people are racist, you're just evil and you're racist and this is just a sign. And they try and shame you, right? It's gaslighting is what it is. That's what we're talking about. They gaslight you if you don't sign off on it. And so it's an appeal to the emotional response to get these faculties to get their um, appetites corrupted. In the meantime, because of that, the emotions, one of the, uh, uh, the emotional response in relationship to other people becomes one of anger, right? So as a result of that, the irascible appetite starts getting slow and slowly out of control because you're seeing, oh, all these white people are just so racist because they're, they're evil, they're evil, they're evil. And so over the course of time, the emotional response relationship becomes one of anger. Right. Okay. So that's their goal. But they also then again use the shaming process and that's all to strip that. But the emotional, the appetites start to lose in, in especially when communists are involved, when they're brainwashing people, the appetites start to or lose their virtue. They're corrupting the virtue and they're trying to render people vicious. That is, have vices in relationship to how they're inclined to relate to people. Okay. So... The cogitative power has changed. The memory gets changed. Um, and they'll even go back and say, you know, you used to think that so-and-so was a good guy, but, you know, and then they'll paint some picture of him that's just completely untrue. And again, that's because they want to change your memory of it. The emotions are then done. So then once that happens, if it's done enough, or if the person um, volitionally gives into it, when it comes time to make a judgment about the truth of what they're being presented... So, like, if the mainstream news media, if they're constantly saying it, and this is where the constant part is, and I'll, I'm going to talk about, on a psychological level, why the constant thing is so important. But if they constantly keep doing it, eventually your judgment about the thing 
is going to turn or change. And that's their goal, to get your judgment to change. Because then once your judgment change, then you'll just follow the, your will will follow upon that. And then you become a willing subservient to their feeding you the information and their approach to things. Okay. So the first thing is it has to be this constant negation of all of your prior formation. Okay. Why does it have to be constant? It's based upon the fact that by as, as, as a uh, natural inclination of the third, third category of natural inclination of the natural law, we have a natural desire to know what's true. We also know by the, by the structure that God built into our mind that there is a thing called the principle of coherence, which means if two things are true, they're going to fit together. And they're not going to contradict each other. The minute there's contradiction, intellectually, we know they're not true. Okay. So what has to happen? Well, by the constantly hearing of it, you hear it in all sorts of different venues. You start to think that there's this coherence in, the tr uh, in what's being proposed. And so they're trying to pander to that particular aspect of the natural law to judge based on the principle of coherence. And that's why it has to be constant. Right? Part of it, all the reason it has to be constant is because... <clears throat> if it's not constant, then people's thinking will go back to their prior habits. And if you're trying to strip them of that habit, you can't give them any time to think anything through. You have to just all of a sudden pop it on them, and you have to be constantly at them through the whole process to strip that from them. Okay. The next is you actually have to make sure that there's no contra information. In other words, you have to remove from them their ability to gain knowledge about what's really going on or what the truth of the situation is or something that's contrary to what you want them to know. Because if, they, if you give them that opportunity, that means that the cogitative power, if you're constantly doing this, but people can still have access to the, the contra information, then what happens is, is people start judging this and they realize, well, these people, they're just pushing this, um, this narrative constantly. That's just bogus. It's just false, right? And as a result, the cogitative power then is confirmed in its prior habituations, and that's the last thing that they want. So you have to make sure there's no contra information whatsoever. So even when they were torturing guys like in, in, the, um, in, uh, in prison, like in Vietnam, they would be bombarding them with, with you know, reports and this and that all the time with that. And then they made sure that they couldn't talk to each other. They couldn't have any connection with each other. You have to fracture the people. You can't because if they – because one guy can say, hey, no, don't listen to this. I just saw this. This is what's going on. You can't have people giving you confident information. That's why you have to isolate everybody. Okay. <clears throat> and then the last one is you actually have to feed them a positive – uh, a set of positive associations and disassociations. So, which is uh, the thing that you're ultimately wanting them, they, this is the process of reforming these in a series of habits. That is, you want their cogitative power to be associating a certain way, their memory to be associating, uh, the memory to remember certain things, the emotions to be inclined a certain way and their judgments to be a certain way. And so you have to start providing them with an information. It's not just that you negate their information, but you have to provide them with an alternative form of information. So, for example, the guys that were in prison, they would say things like the United States is evil. Look at all these people it's killed, blah, 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 blah. And then in the meantime, they're, they're, they're showing you, you know, the um, Mao, the communist leader, being all benign to people and this and that, right? So this is exactly – this is – and so they'd start building a different series of associations. Um, the also, uh, this process where you negate this on the cogitative power side in relationship to the association, is the goal here is, in the, is to get the cogitative power to get to the point where it's so habituated by their negation and the, what they've built up that people will actually look at reality, and when that reality comes into the image and the imagination, the cogitative power is going to go back into memory, and because of its habituation, and because of what's in memory, it's going to bring something back into the imagination, into the image that's going to falsify the image. That's how you disconnect people from reality. For example, 
watching television. You got the reporter standing there saying things like it's mostly a peaceful protest while it's literally burning to the ground in the background, right? It's literally to get people to start, and it's all based on the trust that we give to the mainstream media, which we shouldn't be trusting them at all. They should have to demonstrate that they're trustworthy, right? So, but if you keep doing that, or another one, you know, the people are in the grandstands chanting an obscene thing. Meanwhile, the news media anchor woman says, oh, they're saying, let's go Brandon, right? Okay, look it. We can hear what they're saying, right? The problem is, if people have, if these habits have not been well formed, and if they're not well maintained, and that's what we're going to get to in the next conference, um, that is the habits of the cognitive power, memory, emotions, etc. If those aren't maintained properly, what's going to happen is, is over the course of time, people just don't have the appetitive fortitude, that is, in the appetites or in the will, to maintain the course in keeping their thinking straight. And so over the course of time, they start getting sucked into it. This is why, um, who is the guy that says if you lie enough, people begin to believe it? Goebbels. So when Go- Goebbels knew this mechanism, you just keep lying, and eventually, if people if people don't actively think, now this guy's just lying, he's just a liar, right? If you don't do that, then what happens is over the course of time, or if you don't know the person's a liar, over the course of time, your understanding of things will shift to their narrative because it's constant, and they're feeding you this opposite, and they're not giving you any information otherwise. And so that process, <clears throat> once the people go through this process, when they come out the other end, their patterns, their habits of thinking are completely different, and that's how brainwashing happens. This is one of the reasons I tell people, which we'll talk about later, turn off the television, just turn it off. It's one of the first things. So when it comes to, you know, part of the, the, the wrong associations, you've got to tell it, no, I know, I'm not going to listen to you. No, I'm not going to listen to you. Or when they say certain things, and you, you actually end up having to say this. So this is the process by which brainwashing goes through, and this is the actual structure. So negate their habits by giving them contrary associations, build them up with positive ones, and make sure they don't get any contrary information. Okay. So that's just the general structure that we see. Uh, any questions? So that's why censorship of the contrary information is so important. That's correct. Yeah, that's why they have to make sure that you can't have any access to this information. Yes? Is this what happened to the church in the early 70s? Uh, This is is exactly what happened to the church in the 60s and 70s. It was the same thing. Uh, Let me give you, okay, let's just walk through it. So what what were we told in the 70s? And I've mentioned this to people, right? What were we told in in the 70s? First, uh, the contrary information, what happens is, is they just stop preaching what the church has always taught. And what do they do? They make sure that the seminarians never learn Latin. Why? Because then if you know Latin, then you can take a look at the tradition, which is the contrary information. We don't want people looking at the tradition. So don't teach them Latin, right? And don't teach them Greek, etc. But then the association. So what, did, what, what, were we, what was the negative things that we heard? Old mass bad, old mass bad, old mass bad. That's all we heard for 20 years was that the old mass was bad. Then what did they do? New mass good, new mass good, new mass good. That's all we heard for 20, 30 years, right? And so by the time you come out the end of it, most people got brainwashed. They thought, oh, yeah, man, that was bad back then, you know. Sorry, it wasn't as bad as you like to think it was. In fact, it's worse now, Right? And so this is, this is the exact problem. I'm just using the mass as an example. This is exactly what they did. Or they'll just say the church's traditional teaching on this was bad, it was bad, it was bad. And then they would field you other nonsense to make sure that you don't get any of the contra information. Which is why when a priest comes out and he starts preaching this contra information, oh, they got to shut that down just as they do on the social media, right? So, yeah. Is that why some priests have such a reaction that's to right. the old mass? Yeah. Because they've been brainwashed. And- yeah, that's right. Yeah. And the, the part of it was, too, is, is that the emotional component that they, they did was by changing the disciplines of the church, guys who were slothful spiritually liked it, and so they gave them delight in, in following this easier way, which is why they have just an repetitive revulsion to the church's prior disciplines. 
or the church's primary disciplines were not that over the top. In, point, in fact, if you just follow the church's disciplines, you'd actually grow in virtue and all the virtues. But they didn't, you know, they don't want to do that. So. So how does that relate to, like, St. Alphonsus Liguori um, states that a person who has um, <coughs> hatred for something that's sacred is a sign of damnation. Yes. Does that apply in this situation? <clears throat> yes, it does. Brainwashing? That wouldn't necessarily, would it? Uh, it depends. Yeah, okay. <clears throat> It depends on how voluntary, how much voluntary involvement was involved with the indivi- in the individual. The second thing is, is that um, God gives people sufficient grace to be saved. So there's always going to be contra. Inf- this is what's so ironic. There's always going to be some contra information right? um, from the side of God, enlightening the mind, saying, "Hey, you know, this is this is the real story here," uh, or the person realizing, "Yeah, maybe not." So the point being is, is that it depends on how volitionally they entered into it. Some people just got sucked into it without even realizing it. One of the ways that they, the, uh, another way that they brainwashed people was through, um, um, as I mentioned before, the Sulpician approach to obedience, where you put your mind on hold and you just believe and think what we tell you to think. Well, I'm sorry, that's just communist speak, you know, in the end. I'm not sul- accusing the Sulpicians of thinking that. I think it's just a case of where it just got a little bit over the top. And then St. Thomas says, actually, that's vicious. It's contrary to supernatural prudence. And so what happened is, is a lot of people being formed that way, even the seminarians, you couldn't get through the seminary in the 40s and 50s without signing off on the Sulpician approach of each. You just did whatever you were told, right? And so guys say, okay, okay, okay. And I'm not sure how voluntary that was for, I mean, I think there's different degrees based on the particular individual. But a lot of the older priests, you know, they knew better. I think they still know better. But the easy way of life and the lack of discipline and et cetera um, just fits their appetites. And so they're, they're not really interested in going back. Yes. Hold on just a second. Gabriel's got one and then we'll come to you. So when you um, basically rewrite a memory, yeah. what you're doing is you're not changing it. So like use an example. So you know, you're being told you're... You're white, you're racist, you're white, you're racist, you're white, you're racist. So right. You go back and you have this memory, like, you, you start to rewrite the memories once the judgment, like, caves and gives in to that. That's right. You start to rewrite it, so, oh, I'm racist. So when I hit that black guy, when I punched that black guy, it wasn't because he stole something from me, it was because I was racist. Right. That's the kind of thing that happened. That's exactly right. So you're not necessarily changing the actual pure sense data of the memory. What you're changing is the perspective or how you're looking at the thing in relationship to it or what you're associating with it. So, um, was that Lynn or Kathleen? Oh, yeah, no, absolutely. Absolutely. In fact, um, um, what that's that's yeah it is in other words instead of um look and if these people were really grown up they would just say hey look this stuff happened in the past let's move forward let's look at constructive ways to move forward they wouldn't basically be giving outlet to their destructive tendencies which is which is basically letting the appetites be unregulated so you'd have so you'd end up they'd end up people wouldn't be doing that but important factor our culture is descending into uh immaturity Actually, the, the, one of the, the first priests that pointed that out um, that did a really good job with it was Father Z. He just says it's the reign of immaturity. And he said, you see this, with, and, I, and I started reflecting on it, and actually I think it's just the problem you have with communism in general. Because true maturity ultimately is the person, uh, I mean, there's, variety, there's facets to it, obviously. But one of them is willingness to follow the truth regardless of the personal cost. You have to have a certain degree of sacrifice and you have to be willing to suffer to follow the truth. And so the truth has to become that, I mean, the person who follows the truth regardless of the personal cost is ultimately the one who is the most mature. These people aren't at all. They just want their agenda, right? And so you even see this, like some of the behavior of some of the politicians, you know, <clears throat> There's, I'm thinking of, a, for example, of, a, of a, I think she's a senator from New York. You know, she's very young. Um, and I've been watching her with a certain amount of interest for this reason. 
The reason being is, is because she signed off on the communist ideal, which people often do. And so their initial response to everything is, this is great, we're gonna, we're, everything's gonna be equal, people aren't gonna be hurting each other, there won't be any war anymore, They're, everything's gonna just be hunky-dory because they've bought into this communistic utopia, which is just utter nonsense. But then over the course of time, in order to get that thing implemented, what you have to do to people, which is strip them of their rights, strip them of their ownership of things, you have to start taking their stuff, stealing from them, hurting them, killing them eventually because they're going to stop you. And so by the time it gets done, there's this progression into malice. And so you see her going from this, you know, ditzy, unregulated, delightful uh, attitude towards things to just unregulated malice, anger. She's getting more and more angry as it goes on, which is a sign of lack of maturity. So to answer your question, yeah, absolutely. Makes sense. It almost did our too. Oh, yeah. Yeah, you're seeing that. Yeah, in fact, you're seeing certain members of the magisterium getting um, uh, more and more angry at the fact that what they tried to do in the last 50 years did not turn out the way they thought it was going to or the way they proposed it was going to. And that the younger people are now turning back to tradition. That is, they're looking at the contra information. And so as a result of that, there is, uh, they're starting to get angrier and angrier and angrier. So, and actually as a priest, I can honestly say this, um, that there are certain older priests, not all of them by any stretch of the imagination, because some of them are actually trying to strive for holiness, they're very mature, etc. But a lot of the older priests that are just absolutely stuck in the post-conciliar approach to absolutely everything are the ones that behind the scenes, when you're dealing with them as another priest, they are some of the most vicious, backstabbing, emotional people you can deal with, even though they may not appear that way on the outside. And it's sad, right? Because you realize you're miserable. You got everything you wanted and you're still miserable. You know, maybe if you would have gone the path of sacrifice, penance, discipline, you'd be a little happier. So...